All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted joining us from Utah is David Covey. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great, John. How are hey. you? Excellent. And David is the author of Trap Tales, so, uh, Outsmarting the Seven Hidden Obstacles to Success. And that's what we want to we want to talk about today, um, because, uh, I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, people struggle a lot, uh, a lot with why they're not where they think they should be right in, in their career, in their life, whatever. But they don't always uh they don't they don't always have the capacity to figure out for themselves what it is that's holding them back so can you talk to me a little bit about what was the what was the origins or the genesis of of trap tales yeah that was exactly it my my business partner and i stefan uh you know that we we uh, co-authored the book we play a lot of chess together yeah. and uh in chess the purpose of you know the way the way to win in chess is to be several moves ahead of your opponent right Mm-hmm. And actually to get them to fall into some traps <laughs> that you set for them, that you hope that they do, you know, that they don't see it because you're thinking several moves ahead of them. So uh, so we really liked that as a metaphor. And we thought, you know, oh, isn't that what life is about? You know, mm-hmm. a lot of life, our work life, or, you know, our, our family life, uh, personal life uh, is about traps that we fall into. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the force field analysis. Uh, basically. Yeah. It's it's the analysis of saying for any initiative, you kind of have your current state where you're at. Sure. Then you have your desired state where you mm-hmm. want to go. And you have driving forces or initiatives that are taking you there. And then you have restraining forces. And most of the time, uh, what I've found is people really focus on the driving forces and the initiatives to try to help you go from you know here to here. Right. They don't pay as much attention to the restraining forces. So it's the equivalent of like having one foot on the accelerator and another foot on the brake. <laughs> and the answer is not to put, you know, your foot stronger on the accelerator, you know, to keep pounding it. The answer is to pull your foot back from from the brake right. you know, that's, that's preventing you. So we like to kind of think of like traps in that way. They're really mm-hmm. the restraining forces. They're the obstacles or the barriers that are preventing us from achieving our goals or reaching our, ge- our dreams that yeah. we want. So, because a lot of people I find, uh, and, I, and I don't know whether it's it's always been like that, but particularly now it seems to be that people drift a lot or they just sort of let's see what happens and they're not very proactive about um, moving their career forward, whether it's in sales, whether it's in whatever, but they, they kind of outsource to fate. That's what I always call it, like outsourcing your destiny <laughs> to fate. Um, so to talk to me about a couple of the traps. Like you're, you're one of the first ones is is the relationship trap right yeah so we have uh in the book we have you know seven traps but we've created a course uh that's more oriented towards businesses Mm -hmm. so let me focus on some of those sure yeah absolutely uh keep it more business oriented so one of the uh, the first traps is the busyness trap and that's drowning drowning in the thick of thin things Mm -hmm. and we say the thick of thin things because it's not the thin things are really not the important things. It's the non-essentials. There was a study done by the uh, the workforce front that looked at uh, the work that we do, the interactions of work, and they found that half of the interactions that we have at work are non-essential. You know, mm-hmm. they're just really not that important. And if you think about it, you know, with uh, uh, technology, you know, when tech back in the uh, '85, they had a study that was done that said. Hey, with technology advances coming, you know, we're going to only be working like 30 hours a week, you know, because we'll have so much more time because all the time. But it's it's had the opposite effect, as you know, Mm -hmm. it's it's actually increased the expectations. So we have all of these things coming at us. We really don't have a filter for how to manage it or how to control it. And and the answer is the conventional approach is become a better juggler, you know, just learn to juggle everything all the balls in your air, and, and obviously that's not going to work. We have to learn to say no. I love the example of uh, Apple uh, for focus. You know, uh, when Steve Jobs came yeah. back for his second act back in 1997, he, he killed literally like 300 projects that people were working on. And he drew a matrix, and he said, we're going to make two products for the consumer, and we're going to make two products for the professional, and everything else goes. <laughs> yeah. And 
he helped get the company back on track, but it was because of focus. He was willing to focus the company. And today, Apple is the most valuable company in terms of market capitalization. And they sell, uh, most of their sales come from like seven or eight products, right. you know, through like hundreds of products. Uh, but it's the power of focus. So, th so that is really one of the traps that we have is that we're just – we're busy, but we're not really busy on the essential things. Yeah. So why is uh, and and it's a it's a it's a theme of mine that I, I've talked about for years as well is the idea of focus and, and but focus seems to be so difficult for people because to focus you have to make choices right as you as you just outlined and yeah. people don't like making choices because if you choose one thing you by default unchoose other things right and people sure. don't want to do that so we talked today about how oh we're so busy and. And we've got so many things going on. But as you say, a lot of it's distraction or non-essential. How do yeah. you help get people uh, to focus and to understand what are the important things and to set aside the others? Yeah. So I think that, first of all, you know, you got to uh, you got to help people understand that they lead their own life. And if they choose to have a, an ad hoc life, they're, they're not going to be able to be they're not going to be very happy because they're just going to whatever happens to them is, is what's going to happen. And, and they're going to be very disappointed. So you have to help, you have to help people say, Hey, you know what? You have control over your life. You, you, you're, you're not a victim. You, you, you know, you have, yeah, everybody has some bad things happen to them and you always have things that you can't control, but you can lead your life and you can lead your business and, and you can lead uh, your, your, your marriage. Uh, you don't have to be a victim. And so I think that's the first you know, step is to help people realize that they are the controller of their life and, and they can control their own destiny. And then secondly, uh, I think that uh, it, it's really important that people think about what their vision is, you know, where their direction that they're headed. A lot of times people, they get, uh, they get lost or they get distracted or they forget. We, we have one of the traps we talk about is the career trap, you know, and that's where people settle, you mm -hmm. know, in the career. They're not happy. Uh, there's really four aspects to a successful career. It's the financials. You know, you want to be paid yep. fairly for what you do. Uh, that your mind, you want to have your mind engaged. You know, you want to be creatively utilized. Uh, the passion is the heart aspect of it. You know, you want to be passionately engaged. And then you want to be able to feel like you're making a contribution. And so many people settle. They just settle in their job. They settle in their life. And they they're living at at a much lower level than where they where they could be. And I think that if you help them say you know see that if you can focus uh, on your core priorities or the things that you really matter and let the other stuff just fall by the wayside, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it it really helps them. But my father used an analogy. My father yeah. Stephen he wrote sure. the Seven Habits book. He used the analogy of of uh, you know. Uh, of the big rocks mm -hmm. and he, he had this jar and, and it had rocks and pebbles and water and sand. And what, what, what people found is that if you put the, the pebbles and the sand and the water in first, you didn't have time to put the big rocks in, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't have enough room, but if you put the big rocks in first, then you could fit in some of the pebbles and the sand. But guess what? If you can't fit in all the pebbles and sand, so what? Exactly. Don't, it doesn't matter. And so that's really about what our life is about, is that we have to get the big rocks in first, you know, in order for us to, you know, to be successful and to achieve our, our vision and our goals that we want. That's mm -hmm. what really what this is about. This book is about is, you know, if you're finding yourself stagnated or not achieving the success that you want, it's because of these traps that you've fallen into. Yeah, and it's inter a couple of interesting things that you mentioned here uh, about the ad hoc life. And uh, I, I feel that we live in, in a culture now of non-self-accountability, if there's such a word, but where everything uh, is, is saying nothing is your fault and everything is external to you. And, and that runs counter to what you're, to, to what you're saying here. And I, and I, and I totally agree with what you're saying. So, uh, so is that, is that a tough thing? I mean, whether you're doing this organizationally or, or from an individual point of view, but to promote this concept of self, you have to accountability. You have to look at yourself first before you look at other people, hold other people accountable. 
<laughs> it's the toughest thing, <laughs> the toughest thing in the world. And uh, I was formerly at my father's company, Franklin mm -hmm. Covey, for 16 years. That the first habit of the seven habits is be proactive. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're responsible for your life and you're accountable for the choices that you make and you can't blame others. Uh, and that is the toughest thing because it's we have such a, a society today and a culture today of wanting to point the finger at someone else to blame society at large or blame the government or or blame your parents, you know, uh, and, and it's, it's just very natural. It's very hard to take accountability mm -hmm. for your decisions and your choices. We like to call these traps, which hopefully makes people feel a little bit better because mm -hmm. you can say, hey, look, you didn't, you know, because a lot of times people, you know, they, 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 they get where they're at because of some of the stupid mistakes they make. Mm -hmm. But if you can start to think about it, it's like, well, maybe it wasn't so much a mistake. Maybe it was a trap. It was a trap. I, I got caught in the trap. And, and we like that language because uh, uh -huh. it helped people say, hey, you know what? You maybe didn't even fully realize how bad this situation got. But it is part of the trap and part of the characteristics of some of the traps. And so we're going to help you get away. You're going to help you mm -hmm. find a way. And in the book, we talk about these epiphany breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Epiphany breakthroughs are the new insights that lead to new breakthroughs in, in, in behavior. And that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what's important, is you can't view the conventional approaches anymore. They don't work. You have to do the epiphany breakthroughs that are going to get you to, to the new level of thinking. Yeah. And I, and I love here, um, one of your subtitles here, one of your chapters on, on focus is the best things in life take time. And again, I love that message because, again, it runs counter to the yeah. pervasive culture out there, the shortcut culture of where, oh, no, you can have everything immediately. You don't need to you know, work hard for it. You can just get it. Uh, that's another thing that's quite difficult to teach people, isn't it? That, that if things that are worthwhile, they actually do take hard work and time. Absolutely. I have a son that's playing basketball right now and uh, and he, he's got all the, you know, the natural skills for it, but he's not at the level of where he wants to be. And he wishes that he could just jump from, you know, here to sure. here, but he can't, you know, he, he has to make mistakes and he has to learn and he has to practice and he has to work and he has to fail, you know, and and that's just that's the process of life. And I wish there was something that I could give him to help him you know, move this faster to speed this up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't do it. And, and it's, it's just how life works. So uh, it's, 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 and it runs counter to our culture because, you know, if we want an answer, all we do is we Google it and we sure. can get it. We're used to this instantaneous, mm -hmm. uh, you know, answer and results. And most of life is, unfortunately, is not like that, at least the most important things in life. Yeah. Yeah. And now with all this instant digital culture, it's like people think, oh, I can just become famous and rich by not really doing anything. Yeah. That's right. And, and you always hear the stories mm -hmm. of the successful, the yeah. successful stories. You know, you know, somebody that went from, you know, working at a grocery store and being in, in, in living in a you know 900 square foot apartment to suddenly now owning their own island you know yeah. 18 months later you know and yeah. and and but you never hear the stories of uh of the people that you know so those are the the yeah. outliers you know but you never really hear the stories of what most people have to do which is really really hard work for a long time continuous effort uh, and, and eventually, you know, because of their perseverance uh, and so forth, they succeed. Yeah. I have a quote, uh, I'm a big Steve Jobs fan. Mm -hmm. I, I think he was a great, uh, I don't think he was necessarily the nicest boss, you know, or, sure. but I, I, I love his vision. You know, I just think he was just so visionary. But he said, I'm convinced uh, that uh, about half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Yeah, so I, I, I've been an entrepreneur the last eight years of my life, and that's that's really resonates with me. Yeah, and and I like also you you also talk about change, right? And change is obviously yeah. a very difficult thing, but we uh, and I think you deal with this is we're very good at rationalizing why we shouldn't change, or or rationalizing why we can't change right now, or the postponement piece where. We want to change, but this just isn't the right time. So in six months' time or next year, I'll, I'll get on that. Yeah. So that, that, is, that is human nature, you know, is to postpone change. 
and 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 to delay it as long as possible. The problem is is that if you do that, and you wait until if external circumstances force change upon you, then your options are not very good. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at some of the Fortune 500 companies, and a lot of them have rested on their laurels, yeah. and they just kind of think, well, I can just keep you know doing what I'm doing. Look at General Electric. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm shocked and uh, 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 surprised to see what's happened with that. You know, truly terrific, amazing company for many many years, but uh, is now you know kind of really fallen, uh, mm-hmm. in a big way. But I, I think a lot of it is, it's not just individuals, it's organizations as well. Yeah. No, Trying absolutely. Change as long as possible because it's difficult and, and, and we'd rather stay in our kind of comfort zone or little bubble. Right. Yeah. And the funny thing, the, the thing that always amazes me is, you know, organizations try and do it and people in, in, within those organizations try and try and keep everything very controlled the same. But as we mentioned earlier, but the, but that's not reflective of life, right? Life is a it's constant is constantly in flux. We don't know what's around the corner tomorrow. There's a surprise, and guess what? When it comes, good or bad, we'll deal with it and we'll figure out a way forward because we have to. But in business, we try to create this very controlled environment. That totally. Yeah, you're familiar with James Di- uh, Dyson. Yes, he created the Dyson uh, yeah. ba- bagless mm-hmm. uh, vacuum. So I love I love him uh, as an example of kind of how how business is done or, you know, or, or how you create new innovations. And he basically says, look, it took over 5,000 prototypes, 5,000 prototypes mm-hmm. to finally get the per- perfect, you know, uh, a vacuum system. And, and it was really around failure. You know, he was just saying that that's, that's really what it's about. And I think that that's what we kind of fear is, is failure is because we, 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 we want to be able to, appear like we have everything figured out mm-hmm. and you know there's you know we don't have any problems <laughs> you know and you certainly look at people's social you know media and so forth and it looks like everybody has a perfect life <laughs> and, you know you have a you have a, a difficult life and you're wondering what's wrong with me you know but it's not true you know it's all a facade it really mm-hmm. is but the, the formula is really try fail learn repeat mm-hmm. and, and and that's really what we need to be taught more about in, in business and in life is it's just about trying failing, learning from that, and then repeating. Mm-hmm. And uh, any of the great innovations, you know, uh, that we that we see today all all come from that model. Uh, yeah, and, and that's an and, and that obviously requires a company to have a culture of where you can try things and and yeah. fail. And I guess part of it is too is if you're gonna fail, like fail quickly, right? If you can yeah. if you see that there's I mean I'm sure Dyson when he was doing all his prototypes, I'm sure there were ones where he was you know, not that far into it, and went, "Whoops, that's not going to work. Let's go another one." Clearly, um, and and obviously, that's one of the that's one of the, the the traps in business is that people prolong things. Yes, yeah, they prolong things. They want it. They wish things that that you know weren't that way. Uh, you're familiar with the company Unilever, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Unilever. I, I worked for Procter and Gamble, so I, mm-hmm. I used to compete against Unilever in the soap category. They mm-hmm. they made laundry detergent. Procter and Gamble made laundry detergent. But, uh, and this, this is a story back in the 1960s, uh, it's contained in the book called Black Box Thinking mm-hmm. uh, by Matthew Syed, uh, he's a Brit. Uh, but anyway, uh, he, he wrote this, uh, he, wrote, he, he talked about the story about how the, uh, the, the nozzle, so you have a nozzle that makes the laundry detergent. This was before, this was in like in the, in the 60s, you know, this was before we had the little pods now. Yep. Mm-hmm. You had powder, but mm-hmm. the nozzle kept clogging. So they took it to the mathematicians. And of course, the mathematicians, you know, they're so smart and they can just give us a formula. And they, and they gave them a formula and it didn't work. So they gave it to the biologists. And then the biologists, they were willing to do trial and error. And actually what it took is it took 449 different iterations wow. to produce this perfect nozzle <laughs> that could produce this laundry detergent. And so uh, to me, it's, it's, it's just, you know, Pixar is another example. Yep. Uh, Cat mold. Uh, a lot of people see Pixar movies, love Pixar movies. Well, he says that when we first produce these movies, you know, first start working, he says they're not very good. <laughs> In fact, they suck. And he says our job is to take them from suck to non-suck. <laughs> and, and, and we do that through the iteration process. We, we work, we work, we work. 
until we finally get uh, a great movie. So a lot of times, you know, we have this image of thinking, well, there's people out there that are just geniuses, <laughs> and, and then there's me, right? You're right. And and so I'm not genius, so you know, I have to I have to work hard. But everybody that has any great success in life has done it through work, work, work. The, the Beatles, you know, we look at the Beatles, mm-hmm. uh, one of my favorite bands. Uh, when, by the time they got to America in February of uh, 1964 on the Ed Sullivan show, they had performed like 1,200 performances. Mm-hmm. That The Hamburg period for 15 months, yeah. you know, was they performed more during that period than most bands do in their whole life. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't just, yeah, they were, they were, they were geniuses, but they did the 10,000 hour rule. You know, that yeah. Glass talks about it. And, and, and it's really, it's, it's, there's no shortcut. Yeah. It's all work. And if you think about it, there's, I mean, the reality is there were probably 10,000 other Beatles out there who didn't put in the hard work. Exactly. Of, so this is a great, great um, uh, place to, to conclude here. Cause I think you, you just touched on something really important as a takeaway is, you know, whether it's organizationally, whether it's um, personally or whatever is that you have to start somewhere and yeah. then you have to try and try and understand that this is a process, not a, I'm not going to change my life. I'm not going to change my business tomorrow. Uh, I'm, I can start the process but it'll be a process. Yeah, that's right. And and the one of the main messages in the book and in our program that we teach is the message of hope. And it's that anybody can change the trajectory of their life at any stage of their life. Okay. So a lot of times I think we think that, uh, oh, I've just, you know, I've gone down this road too far or I, I you know, I can't change. I'm 50 years old or, and, and it's hogwash. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, we can, we, we are, the controllers of our destiny and we can change our life at any, in any, any stage of our life. I think we just have to look at it and say, I'm going to do it by making these small steps, mm-hmm. you know, and, and taking these small steps, uh, new year's resolutions, the big mistakes that people make in new year's resolutions is they set too many, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Set 10 or 12. And so they're all forgotten by, you know, by the end of January or February. Yeah. So, uh, so, I think the way that you enact change is really by starting small. Uh, don't try to take on too many things. Just say, I'm going to do one thing, what, you know, one thing differently to affect some of the change. And if you start doing that, then you start to build momentum. You start to get some success. It's not instantaneous, you mm-hmm. know, but just see some small successes and some small successes uh, can give you confidence that you're headed in the right direction. Then you take another action and then mm-hmm. you another Action. But the key thing is to take action. Yes. You know, don't wait. Don't delay. Uh, don't try to take too much action, but take some action that can help you propel you to your goal. Absolutely. And if you choose not to take action and you choose not to do anything, that's fine. But you have to own where you are in your life. It, just accept that you, you've chosen an ad hoc life, so you're going to get whatever, <laughs> whatever ad hoc things are going to come at you. And uh, and don't don't blame uh, don't blame your spouse or your parents yeah. or the government or city or whatever for all your problems that you have. <laughs> exactly as I, as I said, I call that outsourcing your destiny to fate. Outsource your that. life to fate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, David, this has been fantastic. But before we go, I'd like you to tell everybody just a little bit more about um, yourself, your organization, and how they can learn more about what you guys do. Yeah. Sure. So uh, my business partner, his name is Stefan Martix. He lives in Dallas, Texas. He's originally from uh, France. So he says, bonjour, y'all, <laughs> down in uh, Texas. Uh, but we started this company. We were both at Franklin Covey. We started uh, a, a licensing business. So we have opportunities to license intellectual property, the best intellectual property on the mm-hmm. planet, like content like uh, David Allen's Getting Things Done, right. which we take all over the world. Uh, so check us out there at uh, smcov.com. Uh, and then we have uh, our, our new program, which is called Trapologists at Work, which emerged from, uh, from uh, a Trap Tales book. And a trapologist is a person who detects and avoids the workplace traps and helps others do the same. Yeah, so uh, it's our own term. We, we made it up. It's called trapologistsatwork.com. Uh, and so uh, check us out there. 
Yeah, I love it. And I and I think, uh, you know, make 2019 the year that you go and uncover all of these traps. So I would encourage you to check out David and his company. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, your CRM. Thanks again, David. It's been fantastic. Look forward My pleasure. to seeing you all again soon. Thanks so much for having me, John.